welcome to a very special edition of the Levity Zone, for it is now that we embark on a new leg of the journey into the zone with the start of the Levity Zone salons. Drawing from our Ojai salons of 2013, I decided to start a local San Francisco Bay Area based version with the very first one held at our home here at Ancient Oaks Farm in the Santa Cruz Mountains. This inaugural salon took place one infamous winter's eve on December 7th, 2013, and featured, in order of appearance, yours truly, Dr. Bruce, Jacob Amon, Mark Belushian, Mikey Siegel, and eventually in came Travis Rios. The theme for this first salon was How do you integrate deeply powerful spiritual experiences into your everyday life? For me personally, this was one of the most important themes yet taken up in the zone. For if we cannot integrate our most preciously held experiences into life, become better human beings for ourselves and for others, then those precious elevated states doled out from some ineffable source are, in some sense, wasted. Such experiences come few and far between in a human lifetime, so successful practices to integrate them not only honor their source, but could help to create a better world. So count on more stimulating conversations from subsequent salons. There are even plans in the works for an online Levity Zone salon. Let us know if you would like to be included in the Bay Area Levity Zones, or in the Levity Zone in cyberspace, or indeed if you would like to start your own zone wherever you are. And yes, we intend to include a better diversity of voices beyond our initial group of guys, so women out there are warmly invited to join future salons. Tonight's theme is how to integrate truly profound spiritual or body or insightful experiences, how to integrate them into life. I mean, all of us have had them. So anyway, that, that was what I threw out is, is I need some help, you know, because my experience is now going into the realm of being a story, you know, not felt. Right. But when I was up in Nevada City, I was telling the story again, and then it became an experience again. Mm. It became inner, very emotional, very rolling, and I was back. It's almost like the experience is giving you one more shot at integrating it in a different way other than the head and words and story. It's like, okay, here, you can still feel it, kid. You know, go for it. Go for the integration that it really was. <clears throat> this was helped by my friend Tom, who basically said, oh, shut up. I don't want to hear your stories. I want to hear how it transformed you. What did it make you into? How did you feel differently? How were you uplifted? And it finally, he like pushed back and said, I don't want to hear the stories. It's all nonsense. It's not you. And he's, he's, pretty, he's pretty deep as a guy in this area. And so then I was just thrown back. And all we did was look at each other and did the energy between us. It was just, that's all we did for a couple of hours. And wow you know that's what that was about hmm. right. but have you observed like if you've had moments where you're definitely in a prolonged telepathic field with at least another or a few people and you're still in a total space of understanding but also flexibility and able to be creative and you know playful and enjoy that you obviously don't need to say very much but then how you transition back into the this logos or whatever yeah. this platform <laughs> well one of the guys who's here last week was with us in peru Absolutely. he said <clears throat> man he lives in downtown la right so he gets back to that environment just this overwhelm of the world just slams in he said it just like pushed the experience out of me and the only way i can get it back is if what he used was uh, the music that he recorded, the Icaros, and smells. He managed to get some, mm -hmm. some aqua de florida. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he would spray it on himself at his desk mm -hmm. at work, and it would bring it back. I have visionary on the walls at my work, too. 
And I spray that stuff in there as well. I actually I have a little bundle of sage, and for me, you know, mm-hmm. it's the connection has been with sage. Let's in see. fact, my, my wife is chewing me out constantly because I'm occasionally saging the house, and she's like, you're saging the house all the time. Why do you keep doing this? I'm like, it's... You're trying to maintain that connection. Yeah, so it's very much happen. that. It's yeah. very much that. There can be another flip side of that too, um, not discounting the, the side of having a thread that can pull you in, um, which is really useful. But then there's the other side of having another another state that you are attached to or that you're in a state of desiring, um, even if it is in essence a, a very desirable state to be in, or even like it can be a state of no desire or something like that, a state of contentment but it can become another chase, another hunt, another like thing, another way to be incomplete in the present moment, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah um, and right. so that, it just makes it very tricky, <clears throat> that whole thing. Well, when our fearless leader in Peru pointed out that you're going to get back to the world and the world does not make it easy for you to integrate this stuff. Back 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 5,000 years ago, you actually could be in contemplation. I mean, if you were fortunate, you were in a monastic situation or somehow, or you're in a tribal situation, you actually could go off for a month on on your own and integrate, and it was acceptable in the culture. Like the young warrior that has had an experience and the chief says, well, go off, you know, we'll see you. And there's no obligation. There's no logistics. There's nothing that's going to fill your, your brain with just clutter it and push it out. So in some sense, the experiences have to be so much stronger now and less subtle. Yeah, and I, but I think as a companion to that, I think it speaks to one of the big missions for our scientific and technological society, which is how to create a society that facilitates that process rather than hinders it, or how can we mm. create mm. tools that can integrate into the existing sort of technological infrastructure that are constantly reinforcing that and catalyzing it rather than having the opposite effect. Instead of having the monastery be something you go to, the monastery is, but bring it to you here. Even coming back to the the city, I mean, you can be on point and maintain your complete focus, which would probably make you very unrelatable to other human beings, mm. and you would not be able to weave into the fabric so easily. But, you know, in a future society, maybe we'll have more support again for wandering mystics instead of having this homeless issue. We can um, have a society that supports this sort of psychic, psychological, visionary state as a priority. So it's looking for people who are making little little micro ascensions and helping them out, or it's finding somebody wandering the streets and that person's valued, like they kind of were in the soothsayer days and you know Pleistocene Europe. These people were the entertainment. Yeah, they were also to be feared, and they also told the truth, and they also brought news of the world to these Stone Age village culture yeah. where there were no big cities and it was just this enormous grid. Of wandering people, yeah, <clears throat> pre-literate Europe. I think that the manifestation of these mystical realizations and and experiences seem to be very much um, colored by the context, by the cultural context, societal context, um, expectations, beliefs, religion, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so perhaps what will happen is that there are new versions of enlightenment, new colors and flavors of mystical experience and mystical realization that are particularly suited and adapted to this this modern society, this modern infrastructure. And maybe that can be, you know, a goal instead of thinking or assuming they're incompatible, mm. which that assumption mm. will, by its very nature, make it incompatible because mm-hmm. so much of this is literally constructed or restricted by belief. So as long as we maintain the idea that these mystical states are incompatible with this or that, then they will be. But if we can think in terms of integration and compatibility, there could be an interesting new phenomenon that occur. Like the reason why we're doing this levity zone, this first levity zone, mm-hmm. for me, I mean, this is Jacob's idea, but I, I got a download, which was one of the experiences in Peru was 
I'd gone through a particularly rough and tumble session, I was put in this virtual group of guys that were just like ordinary guys and they were listening to jazz. I felt myself being moved back and forth. This was a vi so, is this part of your vision? It was part of a vision. Okay. I was going to be moved back and forth in this group of guys are just listening to jazz and they just shared their hearts with each other and whatever. And the madre, you know, said, kid, if you have this in your life, all your freaking problems are solved. End of story. This is all you need is this kind of companionship. And so I thought, I can make this happen. <laughs> you know, I can, this is going to be manifested and sort of in a regular basis. So that's what this is. And so in a way, this discussion about integrating experience came from a message about how to integrate experience. When you come back from experience like you've had or I've had recently, and you know, you guys certainly have had, I mean, what do you do? You talk with love and with appreciation and you just bury your soul and you pour it out and you tell the story of what you saw, but you also try to bring the entire feeling and that by doing that, bearing yourself, making yourself vulnerable, you almost validate the experience. You make it beautiful. You assure yourself that it was okay to have had it. Other people hear it, and then other people gently give you advice. They say, you know, I had an experience like that too. You know, I'm not alone, and this is what happened. It's something I'm finding, like, as I'm going into, like, the professional world, I'm drinking coffee a lot more. Coffee is, like, the epitome of like that kind of energy that our society embodies. It's like, go, 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 do, go, 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 extend yourself more, more than you can possibly do, but you have to do it anyways, like, go fast. I, I like your phrase, like manic monkey mind. I've heard you use that before, Bruce. Um, that's really what it is. Like I find myself in a very manic state now that I'm entering the professional world. Mm. And I don't think it necessarily has to be that way. And I don't think it should be that way. So as a spiritual seeker, which I think you also are, how do you counterbalance that daily conditioning that you may be receiving? Well, the thing is, I know that it's a temporary situation. When I'm in my like practice, I don't want to be embodying that. Uh, like my own practice, like on my independent path. One experience I had at Burning Man, which is this, I don't know if I told you guys about this fellow Gino Yu from Hong Kong. So I've known him for about a decade. Oh, yeah. He's this ebullient professor from Hong Kong Polytechnic. He is both in AI research, like he has Mark Tilden and Ben Gertzel now in his lab, which are two real AI robotics types. But he's into the consciousness side of things. So here's what happened. I did the talk at Fractal Planet. I came out and there he is standing there. And I hadn't seen him in like five years. He looked different. You know, people at our age, like they totally change in another five years, right? It's <laughs> bingo. Oh, that's Gino. Doesn't look like quite the young, fresh-faced Gino he did. But he then hung out at our camp for two days. He just kept coming to the tea house. And he said, I'd like to try a practice with you. And the practice was very, very simple. He said, I think you'll, you may find that it's the doorway, the doorway in, into the future. And he just simply sat, and this is something you can do with yourself. He sat with me in perfect eye contact, you know, non-threatening, because I guess he'd learn how to do it. <laughs> Would you do this with a New Yorker? I don't know, but and they get a shiner. We sat and we started looking, and then every time I went into thought, my eyes would sort of drift off. And we do this naturally. You know, we look away. He would bring his hand just sort of in front of me and just sort of bring me back to the eye contact. <laughs> just very gently, very, very gently. Just. And so I started becoming aware of it. Like if you tell somebody, people around here stand around with their hands in their pockets and people pull their hands out of their pockets. But he kept doing this, and this went on for like three hours. Three but we hours. kept, yeah, really? right. And I sort of said, I can just sink into this, this is fine. Now I'm becoming more and more used to sustained eye contact, which is tough in our society. Mm. It's getting tougher and tougher because we're looking at these boxes all the time and we're incredibly distractible. But over that three hour period, I became like right now I'm looking there, I'm remembering Gino. That's why I'm not making eye contact with you guys. And he would bring me back, bring me back. After three hours, I said, you know what? I think I got this thing. Because we were continuing to talk. And as we were continuing to talk, I was starting to hear conversations in the room. 
Mm -hmm. I'm starting to be really aware. He says, that's time going away. Yep. Time is going away. And then we kept talking, and I just had some kind of an insight. And then we'd hear a cheer go up at some camp. Yep. He said, watch for that. That's the choreography. <laughs> that's the choreography. And so we kept going and going, and, and I reached this point where I felt this opening occur. It's like, oh my God, I'm feeling this opening up. He said, that's called enlightenment. It's like, it can't be, you know, it's just so simple. And we kept going and going, and he said, then now we're going to walk. Are you ready to walk? So we got up and we were just holding this state. You know, I didn't take any white pills or blue pills or green pills or nothing. And we start walking, and then something happens. He said, you can tell the people that are in thought they're driving by on their bike and absolutely it's like a beacon it's like a, a hovering google glass thing over people like in thought in thought in thought and you could even sense what kind of thought they were in thought 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 and we're just walking along and this big dreadlocked guy zooms past us on the bike and we hear him his bike rattling and he turns his bike around and he comes back and he looks at and he says what's up What's up? <laughs> and Dino said, he's present. And he mm. recognizes other people that are present. And he just turned himself around. What's up? And <clears throat> one other person came walking up to us and says, what's going on? And he said, it's like, it's very small numbers. One in a thousand or one in two thousand. Or so, so it's a really small number that are, are present <clears throat> and can know when other present people are there. So that presence thing was so freaking powerful. And it was so simple. Just the eye contact and then the love that came through and you know it was very neutral in the beginning because he wants to be as neutral as he can be but um, now when I see him on Skype video because he's setting up this consciousness tour of Europe <laughs> that I'm supposed to go on it's completely crazy we're gonna crash parties at Davos and it's a whole long thing but I see this guy's face on on Skype video on his eye contact and this guy He's still the same. I mean, he's... But one of the things he did say was, rather than trying to go toward joy, toward being in a joyous experience, what if you just came from joy? Joy is just there, and you just bubble it up out of you. You're just coming from joy all the time. I said, that's impossible. How can that possibly be? But just a few days ago, I was walking around, and for the first time, probably since I was a little kid, happiness bubbled up. I was like, there's no reason for me to be happy. No reason at all. But I had this happiness bubble up. And then it did it again. Later I was like driving something. Then did it again. It's like, what the heck <laughs> is going on? And I wasn't going to stomp it down and say, this shouldn't be happening. No, happiness bubbled up. Um, no freaking reason. Just came from some deep place. And that was a major message of integration. Mm -hmm. Of this is good. <laughs> you know, this is really good that mm. happiness came from nowhere because then that is the coming from joy. And this, it didn't come through mind. It didn't come through, well, I just ate me a big hamburger, so I'm going to be happy. Or I just, I beat someone out at work for a new position, so I'm happy. And those are all happiness that's generated by mind. Or something from Amazon in the mail. <laughs> from something from <laughs> Amazon in the mail. Something from Amazon in the mail. All that stuff. No, 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 no. There was, it was an unconnected a choiceless awareness, a choiceless happiness that just came up. And that maybe is an opening to the real stuff. Or what Eckhart might say is, what do you find yourself doing if you stop trying to think about it? If you stop <laughs> trying to make a plan and you stop trying to conceptualize your steps and you oh. just allow it to unfold oh. in a natural way? Notice yourself doing something rather than making a plan and having that plan unfold. Interesting. That's a beautiful insight. Thank you. <laughs> huh. I, I almost feel like there's like a dichotomy in this conversation of like thought versus no thought. I think thought, I think both are important. The no thought place is for finding potential, potentiality. Yeah, like just being in the space. And then also like being able to think about a situation while also still like having that beingness. I think both can be done. It's kind of like the yin-yang like overlapped into one. It doesn't have to be separate. There's a sense, an intuition, maybe intuition is what cuts through all this. 
because it comes from a deep grounding and it doesn't really come from thought but it informs everything my intuition mm. is that somehow i can have a whole new life where i'm literally sitting with people being very present yeah yeah and what an amazing <laughs> thing it would be and and the people would be diverse and and Gino's talking about the the business model we could charge you know these high net worth individuals uh, x amount per year to help guide them you know if mm. if we can use presence and intuition and insight but the only the only design, uh, don't miss the the contradiction in that though right. to consciously and mentally plan your move towards how you will construct this thing in order to guide people on how not to do that mm. has some catch to it like it's a question of goals versus living. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you can achieve goals. It's totally possible. The likelihood is that you will encounter lots of suffering along the way mm. because you will have to push lots of stuff aside which gets in the way of your preconceived notion of what you should be doing. Mm. Um, and that's how most people live their life. Or you could just let it happen, let it unfold. And that doesn't mean that you don't live in a practical way and check things off your to-do list. Lots of people like that dude with dreadlocks that pulled his bike around and like <laughs> Gino. And there are lots of people in this world that can and do live in that way. And it seems like that's what you're striving towards. Mm. But like all of us that are on a path, we all make this critical error, which is that through some series of steps and some plan of execution, at some future date, we will achieve the desired state which we <laughs> seek, which it itself is the barrier mm -hmm. to the realization of that state. Yeah. Hmm. Part of me is saying, no, no more mind things, no more planning, <laughs> your, your fuse panel is blown out. You've got to rest, you've got to do all these other practices to ground yourself and bring yourself to health, hike. You've got to hike every two, three days. So not running off, not going off on road trips and no more stimulation. The stimulation got you to the point of um, mental burnout. Well, when I hit the burnout in March, it, it started in November. I went straight to Islamabad. Then I went back a couple more trips, then Islamabad, then two more company trips. So by the time April came around, there was grief from my mother's death. There was like burnout, midlife crisis, all piled into one. It was like, oh great, they're all happening at the same time. It was a surreal state. I was in a completely surreal state. And no internal energy. I mean, it's like a light had been turned off, just gone. And I thought, I could just sleep for six months, you know. But you didn't. You didn't slow down. I didn't. And instead of, like, slowing it down, I went to the higher and higher places. <clears throat> it's a harder thing for me to not seek stimulus. Exuberant and, and uh, ecstatic enjoyment of tremendous stimulation and people and whatnot, which I tried, I guess, for six months... I still come back to this point of the fatigue point. It's not as bad as it was six months ago, but it's not hugely different. And after doing this for a while, you start to think of it as the new normal. And I think this is what a lot of people go through. They hit the burnout wall, and they've got kids and mortgages and multiple careers and layoffs and foreclosures, and they've got so much more going on them, and they, they must hit this burnout phase, and they somehow smear through it. You know, their parents die, they have divorces and huge crises, and they're in that surreal state. They have no option but to, they feel, to keep going, they smear through it, and then that becomes ingrained into them. That whole state is now, baseline. It's, it's baseline, and they just go forward with that as baseline. From that point, I mean, how can they, how can they live? I mean, now they're living with basically a major handicap, a disability which is why the pharma is so big. And Galen said, yeah, this is why two-thirds of women over a certain age are popping pills every day. Because and the, and the 
suicide rate for baby boomers in that generation is astronomical. Yeah. Going back to you know Eckhart Tolle, I mean, he's not shy about saying there is a mass, almost ubiquitous mental illness in this world, and I, I couldn't agree more, and I think any spiritual teaching points to it. And we live in a constant state of internal conflict, hmm. constant between, ultimately, it seems like, our preconceived ideas about what this moment should be and what it is. And we're so inundated hmm. with an immense, all-encompassing identity based around what we're supposed to be, hmm. that it weighs us down physically, tension within our bodies, resulting in sickness, physical stress, failing physically, psychological, emotional stress. I mean, we're, we all live in this, and it's, it's madness. We all hmm. live in this hmm. state of madness, and just to, to varying degrees is all. Yeah. But I also encounter people that seem to be experiencing, like, the highest energetic states and some people totally sustain and really pushing that ever further and so there is that kind of paradox of course too that's going on that i wouldn't call that, it a paradox i would call it an exception yeah it's not paradoxical at all it's just you have the norm right and then you have the ends of the bell curve sure. like you have in any mm. system mm -hmm. yeah mm-hmm the ends yeah. of the bell curve are m much further pushed out than they've been historically probably <laughs> that i don't know I don't know. It seems to me like because of the level of electrical culture that is surfacing with media and, and, and computer technology, just the incredible, you know, visual and experiential display or, you know, the experiences that we can have in these different types of media and entertainment now, it gives you glimpses enough to really be like, OK, what if I could experience these hyper amazing states all the time in a way that was good for my body, actually was making me feel better all the time like super amplified and and then making that the priority i mean it really is just a priority shift that we have to have otherwise we would be never you know doing these things to ourselves on a daily basis that cause us to have to do all this fucking work and processing just to un um, unblock all that stuff that we did while we were working too hard all week and you know what i mean it's like we have these boom and bust spiritual cycles mm -hmm. and we want sustainable spiritual group process and growth and individual growth on that level some people are able to kick ass and they just power through life and do that but obviously the bulk of us are not able to create the noosphere to that degree coming back to our original theme of the evening having profound spiritual entheogenic or non-entheogenic flashes uh, insights really powerful things that then you bring them into your life do they always have to fade or get couched in story or language or have they do they set up an energetic system that for a while or maybe permanently you can tap into i think we've all lost our way after profound visionary things mm -hmm. we're, we're well well skilled and versed at doing that i do think <laughs> that art and being creative in music and creative endeavors in general, especially when, when they're collaborative, especially, is the kind of thing that helps you. You can do it dishonestly without actually being in congruence with your core essence or whatever and keep creating this external thing for a time. But over time, the core kind of retracts and mm. the outer shell of whatever you're creating is not in congruence. And then just the fact that when you do choose to dedicate more of your life's time and energy toward constant creative efforts of some kind, it re-shifts the focus because it, it totally is a different value structure. Uh, so what, what you said originally was quite beautiful. It's like there's a core kernel of the profound experience and then there's the shell that's you. Right. It's always around it. So you have your first big flash insight and then the kernel shrinks down and pretty much disappears because the shell's pretty strong. And you have another one and another one and another one. And then there's this period of incongruency where the shell, the shell doesn't fit anymore. It doesn't really quite fit and you can still fill that core thing. And it's a period of quite a lot of uncertainty because you don't know if you can kick the shell away because the shell protects you from that 
crazy external world or it's your interface to the crazy modern society. But then there's this other thing going on in there. So then perhaps phase three, once those things are kind of loosey-goosey, is um, the shell starts to soften. So the hatching exactly. <laughs> can happen. Then you decide to go deep and you decide to be with that internal thing and your little pecker beak comes out and you start pecking away at the shell of the egg and you're going to come out. And so maybe that's a, a metaphor for taking these profound experiences. Yeah, but I think there is like a new super mind that is coming into being because I do meet these people. I'm not saying their lives are perfect because I've seen plenty of people that were super amazing and super dialed and all these different aspects of their life and really awesome energy and all that. Hmm. And then they encounter things that totally challenge them and really fuck up their, or their life gets crazy, you know? But it does seem like there is this kind of super mind potential that we're stepping into that we can live in that more osmotic Tao way, which is really just realizing that if we really are connected to a telepathic sphere of fields that are out there, maybe we will really start to see that, yeah, we have such delicately and fine-tuned perceptors already innately that we just have to allow to be there and observing, like you said, when you were focusing with the guy, you know, at Burning Man, you started perceiving things much more accurately. And in India, they have the Moonies, right, which walk around silent. And it's just an accepted part of their culture. The aspect of any society, you know, Burma and a lot of the Southeast Asian cultures that have more of an accepted role for people who are really engaged in consciousness. Like, that is mm -hmm. what they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems like if we don't reprioritize that, then, yeah, we will fail because <laughs> we're not engaging with our core and it will, we'll, mm. we'll lose the connection. I mean, it's just that simple, it seems. I have a sense, my sense is that when I look at the trends from marketing advertising to new consumer technology that's coming out, um, trends in sort of the ho hobbyist space, the maker movement, the quantified self movement, the popularity of yoga, all of these to me seem to be pointing to an increase in both an attention towards self, a self-awareness, and also tools, media, conceptualization of and pointing towards self-awareness. So I look at this whole modern sphere and I, I guess I have a very optimistic perspective on it. And that is that that is, if you think of this as a system, not composed of a bunch of individuals, but really as one big system, it just seems to, as a whole, be slowly coming to know itself mm -hmm. in all of these different forms and all of these different manifestations. And when I look out that, again, this is my mind and my story, but I see that continually reinforced and continually justified. Mm -hmm. So I almost have the sense that like what this world needs is not anyone to do anything. What this world needs is for people to find themselves and to know themselves. And that's it. That's all the world needs because the universe is doing itself. <laughs> we don't need to do it. Right. Um, right. We need to just be and learn how to be, which we're all only ever doing. Every moment, every action, every word, every step is only ever pointing towards that. So in a grand sense, there's nothing we can even do. Because there is no even a doer that's an illusion, it seems. Mark, as a person with family, and so you've been in multiple careers, multiple longer careers, how does it all this uh, add up to where you're wanting to go and what you recently you? experienced? Um, you know, I'm a guy that's always lived in his head. And, um, you know, I've always had sort of an abiding interest in... in mysticism and Eastern spiritual traditions and you know I eventually got into a spiritual practice up at Mount Madonna so I 
kind of I'm a student of Baba Harry Das, so there's mm-hmm. like studied yoga up there, you know, I meditation practice all that, and you know, and I've read all kinds of stuff, read lots of Buddhist stuff, and you know, and I mean, just there, there's a whole litany of stuff, you know, a lot of, I mean, it's all head stuff. You've got it's all the all, words. And yeah. right, you know, and I, and I had some conceptual understanding of a huge amount of this stuff, and I had some great experiences in meditation that were, that were really very impressive. Um, while I was sitting on the cushion. I mean, I eventually got up off the cushion and, you know, then went back to, mm. to life as it usually is. And when I did ayahuasca, I had some kind of experience, some kind of fundamental shift where I moved out of my head and I moved into my heart. I could go on endlessly about what this thing seemed to feel like. It was just immense grace and gratitude and love. And I just had this deep felt understanding of what the universe really was all about. And it, you know, and it was all, it all kind of shifted and felt like it was coming from here. And I sort of had this realization that I'd always sort of envisioned myself as being like a gyani, you know, a, a path of knowledge. And I realized that was, I was wrong. I've always been somebody, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm moved when I see acts of, of generosity. I mean, I've always been easily touched, you know, and I just thought that maybe I was a little sappy or something. And I <laughs> realized that, no, that that's touching the part of us that is really deeply who we are. I mean, it's where intuition comes from. It's, it's love. It's our fundamental nature. Mm-hmm. And I went through this shift that lasted for a while. My first couple of days after that trip, I went out to Westcliff and I just sat in the dirt looking out over the water for several hours the day after this this thing and I was just stunned by the degree of peacefulness that I felt. I mean, you know, there was a bit of chatter in the mind, there always is, but there was some kind of detachment that was different than what I had experienced before and it was a, a quietude. and I. There was a lot of chaos at home, there always is. I mean, I got a couple of boys, they're 19 and 22, and you know, it's mm-hmm. like, my wife was always lots of, and it was like, it was, it was just not a problem. Mm. And so for me, what's happened is that, do I reality check with my wife? You know, do I seem different to you at all? She's like, You're not any different, quit asking me, you know? I'm like, well, <laughs> I swear, I feel different, you know? I, I feel like I'm, I'm a bit more peaceful I still go through all the same nonsense in my head that I always do, but I find that if I'm attentive, I can shift to my heart to where I, I feel, I feel, and I'm not thinking. Mm. So I can sit, you know, and I was doing, trying to do this a little bit when I was sitting here where I like, I love you guys in the way that I love my brother Mm. and in, in a sense, in the way that I love my kids, that I, I can feel this and I, you know, I kind of try to bring myself to that place and it's not it's not something I think you know it's just this thing that I it's a felt yeah. sense and it feels like it wow. comes from here thank you yeah thank, thank you. you no and <laughs> um, and I deeply resonate with everything you said I mean you know in part because much of what I have spent my years you know reading and trying to practice at least on an intellectual level comes very much from exactly what you you know describe in fact lately I've gone down the Advaita I'm reading a lot of Advaita and this is Gritada. I mean, that guy's just, you know, I... I That's my book. <laughs> strange thing, I had looked at that book at least a half... Do you know the book, Ms. Mm-hmm. Gadot? It's uh, I, I Am That. that. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I okay. looked at that book yeah. at least six or seven times where I picked it up and I could... I've been reading it for three years. I could never... <laughs> I just never got... And, and it was after my first ayahuasca session. I was I was up for a Saturday class in Malmö, yeah. and I went in the books from out, and I don't know, I just, the chapters of like three pages, and I yeah. read the first chapter, and it's just like, my mouth is just... It's like talking to you, and it, it can modulate too. Yes. Some days you'll look at it and you'll be like, Not so these much. are just black spots on a page yeah. that have no meaning, <laughs> and then Sometimes another... they talk so it's like, direct. Mm, it's like, you're just, it's just talking right to you. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. And so... The question is, how do you integrate this stuff? And, I, and I'm trying to get my head around that because, you know, I, part of it is just, I can talk about the experience and that brings some of it back. But I think, as you mentioned earlier, there's always this sort of dilemma that maybe what you're talking about is the memory of a thing that you've continually talked about and the experience <laughs> itself has kind of been replaced with this story that you're telling yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, 
part of what I've gotten is that I don't think about it too much. I try to just do this kind of shift, this, this feeling of this shift to where I come back down to my heart. And that, that persists. So well, yeah. one, one thing that was coming up, though, and I think also I, advice to myself, ultimately, it seems like those experiences, and I've had like what you're describing, where I've had like a profound, it was, mine wasn't heart-centric, it was more like Yanni style, but like profound realization like, that just shattered my whole identity. And for, I think even a couple months after, I could still feel the effects of it, but the week after was like, it was an intense, really intense. And I remember the, the day after, I just, I was in Oakland and there's that like Oakland, like that lake that you can walk around. Yeah. And I just walked around it I like around three times, <laughs> just like in a ecstatic just state. And, but this is, that's the story part. But the, <laughs> um, the part that I take from it is those experiences, what we take from it is a thread, ultimately. Because the experience is, is done, but the thread is a path back to the experience. And like you were describing, you still kind of have these old patterns, mm -hmm. but if you want to, you can follow that thread back to the old experience. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, over time, that thread gets thinner and thinner and thinner as our old patterns take dominance. And it seems like what we have is an opening and we can choose to continue to strengthen that thread and make that new experience, people call it a vibration or something, that's often what it feels like to me. It's almost like you can change your vibration or your pattern or something mm -hmm. and you can use that thread to reinforce, reinforce, reinforce mm -hmm. those experiences or you can allow it to fade away. And if you allow it to fade away, like everything else, will completely enter into the realm of story. But as long as that thread is there, it's story until you follow the thread and read. Right. Read. That's open the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Reading this That's book great. by Thanks. Hansen called Buddha's Brain. Yeah, Rick Hansen. Rick Hansen, and it's just keep training and training and training. You know, the brain goes toward negativity, so mm -hmm. if you keep bringing it's just a training thing. You're rewiring the neurons, and yeah. you just have to, if you're going to become a long-distance runner, you have to train, and yeah. so... Uh, it just comes down to, to but that. really it's not even training at a certain point it just becomes I'm present always and then it's like not saying that I am present always but if I can be because <laughs> like yeah I mean I, like you were talking about earlier about and that the happiness emotion just wafted out of nowhere you know just came welling up and just when you were talking I felt the like aspects of heart energy even before you started talking about some of that stuff, I could feel you were moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were moving into that moving space, into it, and it was starting to yeah, fill yeah. in the space here. It. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know. Like, I had this really great opportunity when I was a teenager to meditate, um, like three to four hours a day for several years, and was really focused on it. And it became really interesting how after I peeled back, I you know kind of went back to my early childhood and went through all these layers of stuff just kind of scanning it for everything and so that I could possibly clear or, you know, process or whatever, just emotionally and all that. And then after a while, like, it was just amazing how fluid emotion and intuition is. And you, if you want to experience all sorts of crazy ecstasies, I started realizing how I could generate those out of just the will or just the, you know, being in the presence or especially when it was something that was a gift or like you know sharing with others amazing things happen once you're a clear channel for that i love mikey's observation that the world's going along just fine in the doing department it's just each of us i just think you're going to come to presence and know oneself and to understand that you're getting so tired because your head's going all the time so then you find a new avenue a new place inside that from which to come, as Ramdas says, and we just become better, more copacetic, easier human beings to be around, despite the difficulty of our jobs and our commutes, and we just become better human beings for other human beings to experience. Yeah. And so then this wave goes out, 
It's like in about Burning Man, out of the burn, which is going to be the largest burn ever, or the largest structure, I mean, enormous bunch of plywood. <laughs> this this spaceship, this a this UFO, and there was the biggest burn ever, seventy thousand people, and and I got into the crowd, and I realized, you know, I'm taller, so I can always see, and the energy of that crowd was nobody wants to move an inch because they're oh god I, I could get to where i don't see this and everyone was sort of in their own little space of protection trying to keep their place it's such a huge crowd you know, it was going to be something pretty special and i thought okay let's change and then i started talking to the people next to me how are you doing and and i found out there's there were three women that had it their first time when they were you couldn't see because everyone was standing up mm. and uh then I sort of expanded that, and then I kind of switched my energy. I started to s talk to the whole group around. I asked a question, who's here for the first time? And all these people sort of turned and put their little hands up and they said, it's very important for the people here for the first time that they see this, and they have a clear view. So why don't we be good about it and be generous to them and let them go in a block ahead of us? And so they, they are guaranteed to see. And everybody look behind and see if there's somebody you can't see and maybe move back if you're taller. Because everyone's going to stand up. And you, you're sitting down now, right. but no, you're, you're going to be step, stood up and this thing explodes. And 50 or 60 people started to ask each other this question and then give to those people. And I watched this wave spreading around and I could sense there was this wave of release and relief and generosity mm -hmm. was just pulsing. I couldn't tell how far it went, but it just seemed to go out from where we were. And then the burn happened and the explosion, and people were really high and really happy in the area because they didn't feel threatened. They felt, they felt like good about the people around them and what they had done. They felt comfortable. It was like a community. And a couple of them came up to me afterwards and said, thank you for making this the best burn ever. It was just that really simple thing of why is there discomfort? Why am I defensive? What is going on? How do we flip this, flip this around? And uh, it was just beautiful. It was one of the best experiences I've ever had yeah. at Burning Man. We opened this first Levity Zone Salon with the question, how do we integrate powerful experiences into our daily lives? And finished with the story of the elevation of the crowd at Burning Man. Perhaps the answer is there. These experiences teach us that in critical times, we must look deep within and draw from the power of transformative experience to bring up a gift that will help transform a reality in the outer world. This is perhaps the best way to honor and to integrate these experiences to create what Eckhart Tolle calls a new earth. If you would like to become part of a Levity Zone Salon, reach us through our website at www.levityzone.org. And thanks to William Saul family for the intro and outro music, and to Jacob Amon for this episode's cover art. See you next time in the Zone.
Thank you.